are this going conference to ask, will now be recorded. If you are not speaking, we are going to ask that you uh, please put your phone or your mute on mic. Uh, <laughs> phone or your mic on mute. Wow. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Leslie McGee, and I am a staff member with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to this session of the APS State Grant Team Meeting. We would normally enjoy meeting with states face-to-face, -face, which would give us an opportunity to network and share information. However, the support for states to travel to the in-person meetings was usually limited to two staff. The upside of hosting this virtually is that we are able to open up this year's sessions to as many representatives as states wanted to have, and that's a good thing. Today's session is the first of four webinars that will be hosted over the next two weeks, and our subject is collaboration. Next slide, please. Oh, the National, sorry, the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, or NAMERS, and the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, the APS TARC, are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services. Next slide, please. I would like to introduce our moderators for today's session. Maria Green and Mary Toomey will tell you a little bit about themselves and also introduce today's panelists. Maria? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to, to join you today virtually. And Mary and I decided to have a little bit of fun because we uh, are also not using our webcams today, but wanted to see, for you to see some things that we do in our life other than help out the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. We do have the pleasure of being consultants with the team and enjoy working with the team. My hobby is uh, pottery. So usually I'm knee deep in clay. That's my picture with my dog, Tina, there. And hopefully we might make it through this session without Tina barking. And then Mary, as you know, you may have had the opportunity to hear her uh, sing occasionally. So Mary, have you joined us? I sure have. It looks like, is this your like gig costume for your DJ special yeah, event? Yeah, this is mine. Exactly, exactly. So I'm out for hire if anybody, you know, needs a DJ. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, this was just a friend of mine that she came on to cheer me on one time at a at a aging conference here in San Francisco. So Maria's in North Carolina. I'm presently in in San Francisco, and we're um, I'm going to call us the Maria and Mary show. Um, so maybe we'll get to do this again. But we're really happy to be here with all of you, many of whom we know. Um, whether I know you, whether you were a grantee uh, in a in an earlier grant cycle, and I was with ACL or we just had other, other um, nice opportunities to work together. I know Maria knows many of you as well. But um, you know, today, Maria, if it's okay with you, I'll just keep going. Sure. All right. So, um, you know, what we wanted to do is to talk today about collaboration. And so, while I was giving some thought to, you know, what is collaboration and how to talk about collaboration. Um, I'm not doing this to confuse the topic, but more to um, because I got really excited when I started to learn a little bit more about what is collaboration that some of the words that I feel were are, are sort of easily confused for collaboration because they're so closely related to it are turn out to be sort of building blocks to what we're going to be talking about and we're very grateful to our three grantees. Um, who you'll meet in a second, who are going to be talking about collaboration uh, through their grant at the state that they represent. But I was thinking a little bit about how really, you know, I sometimes would use coordination as maybe in place of co collaboration, but what, what's really true, and I thought about this in the context of my family, the coordination is, is just people, someone ordering a variety of people to act together in an effective, unified manner. So my best example of this is that I'm one of five girls born in the span of six years. And so there was an awful lot of coordination to get us out of the house when we were all in high school. 
um, one of my sisters was in junior high. So I was thinking that that's, that's a great example. If you can coordinate to get five girls out uh, showered and blow dried in, in the car to school on time. My mother was really amazing at, at coordination. Cooperation is a little bit different because in cooperation, one person or entities kind of has the right to say, no, I don't want to work with you. And this would be my sisters, Trish and Amy. So Trish had a car for part of high school. During part of that, um, my sister Amy was on the volleyball team. So there was a lot of cooperation on Trisha's part when she had to wait for Amy to finish practice, even though she didn't have to wait for her. She did from time to time. I, I think there was chocolate involved in, get in, in terms of that cooperation. So those are some of the building blocks to collaboration. But what is collaboration? So collaboration is more than just everybody yoking themselves to the same tractor to get the to get the work done it's really a it's about a process that where people come together to define a shared goal via negotiation which when that is done successfully well, I'll pause here just a moment and ask I'm hearing some keyboarding which I totally understand but if you could mute your line we would be grateful so in terms of uh, bringing people together to negotiate a shared goal, um, which is based on coordination and cooperation, but takes takes um, more negotiation than just yoking everyone to the, again to the same to the same tractor or whatever. So to focus on an activity of the negotiated outcome. And since Thanksgiving is around the corner, that was one example I thought of of collaboration that everyone is negotiating, uh, well, in the time of COVID, a lot of negotiation going on about the goal being, what is the goal? To have a safe and healthy, um, delicious meal together, to have shared fellowship together. What, what does that look like? When, what's being brought, who is involved? So that was trying to, try to come up with an an idea about collaboration. But I also loved this quote that I found because I think this is the key to collaboration. This is that spark that you see sometimes at MDT meetings. It's not just about gluing different egos together, putting people in a room and saying, okay, now we have collaboration. It's really about what happens when all of a sudden you see a problem from a completely different perspective. It's as if somebody turned the painting on its side and, and then you saw the picture for the first time. That kind of clarity, that kind of problem solving, I think is, is something that comes when collaboration occurs. And so we're really grateful to, um, to the folks who are gonna be talking to you all today about their projects. But I'm gonna turn it over to Maria to talk about one other, one last piece related to collaboration. So when Mary and Leslie and Andy and I were discussing levels of collaboration, we got to thinking that there's probably three primary ones and you hopefully today may have other examples that you'd like to share, but we know that there's gotta be collaboration within the Adult Protective Services Program itself when you're doing a new project or you're implementing a new uh, training or new program. Then you want that larger uh, corporation and collaboration within your department. So whether that's a Department of Human Services or you're in a Department of Aging or Family and Children's Services, it doesn't matter. When you think of the larger group that your program is a part of, are there collaboration opportunities? And then I think always we think first and foremost, or I, I do, who can our external partners be? And I was trying to think of a, of a current example that I've been a part of, and I've had the opportunity in my small county to be a part of a multidisciplinary team that's been going as a part of the elections uh, work going to nursing homes and assisted living facilities to help residents have the opportunity to vote. And there have been so many levels of collaboration in making that happen. I 
was amazed. It was everything from the elections office to the various long-term care facilities. And then the day of when we arrived, it dawned on me <laughs> because I saw it happen in the good, where it happened well, and another facility where it didn't go well. Where it happened well, the uh, director had organized the staff, the certified nursing assistants and the residents, and they all knew, okay, we're gonna be up, dressed, ready to go out. And the aides had people ready to go because we were doing it all outside. That was excellent collaboration. The example where it did not go well was residents weren't ready, the staffing um, assistants had no idea that they should have been helping get somebody ready. So for me, that was just, that brought it all home about how much collaboration efforts it takes and it's so many different levels to make it go well. So we are really excited that we're gonna get to hear about your work today. And if Mary, if you will go to the next slide, please, I'll introduce our panelists. And if the panelists want to do so, if you want to, um, it's totally up to you, but if you want to open up your cam when I call your name, that'd be great. I'm gonna first mention Kathy Wood. She's at the top of our list here. And Kathy is an APS Training and Grants Program Supervisor for the Oklahoma Department of Human Services. And she has over 20 years of experience in APS. She's a trainer for the new APS Specialty Academy, and then apparently there's various levels of academies for APS training in Oklahoma, and, and she's in charge of all of those. She's responsible for curriculum development and training facilitation. She's conducted numerous trainings on APS-related topics for APS staff, law enforcement, the local university, tribal entities, and other community organizations. She is a graduate of East Central University with an MS in Psychological Services and a BA in Human Services Counseling with a specialization in Aging Services with a double major in Psychology. Kathy, we're glad that you could join us. Next, we're gonna hear from Erin Salvo. And Erin is the Associate Director for APS in Maine. Erin joined that office in 2016. And she primarily at that point was involved in contract drafting, rulemaking, coordinating the legislative process for the office. But then she started her new work in 2017 in her current role. And that is as the associate director. She oversees the statewide program responsible for receiving reports of maltreatment and administers the public guardianship conservatorship program. Prior to joining the department, Erin worked as a civil trial attorney in Massachusetts and as a law clerk to the justices of the Massachusetts Superior Court. She graduated from Michigan, Michigan State uh, University's Eli Broad College of Business with a bachelor's degree. And she graduated with honors from the New England Law School in Boston. Also joining us is Mariah, She's the Assistant General Counsel for the Disabled Persons Protection Commission of Massachusetts. And a lot of us know it by its acronym, DPPC. Mariah has assisted with a number of grants received by DPPC, including a 2015 ACL grant, a VOCA grant to create Sexual Assault Response Unit, and she's also the project manager for the current ACL grant. So if you do it really well, they just keep giving you the work and responsibilities, right, Mariah? Okay, so within DPPC, Mariah is responsible for supporting all aspects of the office's mission, including initiating guardianship and protective services petitions in probate and family court, responding to motions in civil and criminal proceedings, drafting decisions on petitions for review, Oh my goodness, there are so many wonderful things she's responsible for. Um, I won't list them all, but just know that she's busy and hands-on with the day-to-day -day operations of the agency. Maria, uh, Mariah is also a member of NAPSA and recently joined the NAPSA board. Next slide. 
I think we're going to stay on the next slide, slide, right? No, no. Uh, <laughs> I think we're, yeah, the next slide is just questions. So, my bad. Um, yes. We're going to no, get quite them. all right. <laughs> Go ahead. So, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think we can. We can um, just stay on the slide or we can go to the question slide. I'll go to the question slide because that way um, people can be thinking about questions as Kathy, Aaron, and Mariah are talking. Thank you, Maria. And I think what we can do now is just, um, just welcome formally Kathy Wood of Oklahoma. And so Kathy, I think, go, please go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am so glad to be here. Wanted to focus on one of the external partners that APS in Oklahoma has been working with for this grant, and that is the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. It's a clinic that's housed in Oklahoma County, and they actually serve over 20,000 patients that represent over 220 different tribes. Whenever we first started talking about the grant and some of the ideas that we had, we knew that we wanted to focus on some self-neglect work, particularly with clients who are Native American. So basically, we started the discussion on who we wanted to work with, what that might look like, and we were able to schedule a meeting with the Director of Public Health of the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic and some other representatives from that clinic. We wanted to get their ideas on what they thought might work with their patients, what would work best for the clinic, and share with them our ideas of what we were wanting to do with this grant. I love the quote that Mary shared with us at the beginning, that talked about collaboration and being ideas that never existed until we all basically got in the same room together. And that's really how this worked as far as our collaborating with the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. We would not have had, I think, the quality of the grant proposal that we had if we had not met with our partners in this. We um, had our initial plan basically we wanted to focus on self-neglect in eight counties in Oklahoma, eight out of 77. The Oklahoma County is the one where the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic is housed, and we wanted to place one of the self-neglect grant specialists in that clinic to serve as a resource to their staff to answer questions about Adult Protective Services, you know, if things met criteria for a, to be referred to APS or did it need to be referred to another community partner. And the Indian Clinic had some very good suggestions and we were really able to flesh out what that would look like for the clinic. Since they were going to be housed there, we narrowed it down that we were going to house them there two days a week. And we wanted to involve representatives from the Indian Clinic in the selection process. So they actually had two representatives who served on our interview committee and helped us with selecting the person who would be housed there. Now, with COVID, as I am sure many of you have had to make some adjustments to what things look like, we had actually had our self-neglect specialist attend different trainings at the Indian Clinic. They were scheduled to start there, and then COVID happened. So that's kind of delayed some things that we were going to start with the clinic. Now things that were going to be in person, it's looking more like it's going to be virtual. We also utilized representatives from the Indian Clinic in the development of our self-neglect training. We already had self-neglect training developed in Oklahoma, used a lot of the material from the modules that have been developed for NAPSA for certification training, but we wanted a 
specialization on working with American Indians. So went to work at seeing what information was out there, put some things together, things from our own experiences, and we had staff from the Indian Clinic review the material and give input to what they felt like was appropriate for the population that they serve. We didn't want to just put something out there that we drew from research or material that we got from the internet. We really wanted to, to be applicable to the residents in Oklahoma who are Native American. We wouldn't have had, I think, the same quality of information if we had not included our community partners in that development. We also have an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, working with the Indian Clinic, and they have a representative who attends our weekly meetings that we have with our other partners. We partner with Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. They're our research partner in this grant. We also have other people from within DHS who are included on those calls. So it's really been a very good working relationship that we've been able to develop with the Indian Clinic. We have been invited to some of their community events that they've had where we were able to share information on Adult Protective Services and how to turn in referrals, what that looks like. So really, it's just been, a, I can't say enough about the importance of meeting with your partners and getting their ideas having those meetings together to where you can get a good product to where you can really determine what's going to be best for all the entities that are involved. I know that we had some ideas that changed a little bit after our meeting with the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic. And I think it will make for a much better outcome for our clients. I will say I've been asked, would we be able to do this without the ACL funding. And there is no way that we could have had three self-neglect specialists. We could not house someone at the Indian Clinic, either in person or vir virtually, because our caseloads are too high. I'm sure like other states, we just didn't have the staff that were available to be able to do some things that we feel like will be very beneficial to the clients that we serve. So I guess, Mary, are there any questions at this point, or how do you want to handle questions, if there are any? Yeah, really good question. Really good question. Um, why don't we hold questions until um, Aaron and Mariah have also spoken, and then we can take them all together. Okay. So. Thank you so much, Kathy. I really, we really, really appreciate it. And I believe we can now go to Erin was going to be next. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm also gonna talk a little bit about um, coordination with our external partners, specifically our research partners in Maine for our current grant project. We're in year three of a, a research project and just off the bat, like Kathy said, uh, it, it wouldn't be possible for us to engage in this type of work without the ACL funding, uh, simply because um, we don't often have, have the chance to take a, so, such an active role in a research project. Past research projects have been more of a being approached, can you give us a data dump and we'll look through uh, your electronic system information. And, and this is a chance for us to be really engaged in the research process. And in Maine, what we're doing right now is um, where we developed a client survey that we're giving out to all of our clients who are um, 60 years or, um, of age or older. And then um, in two counties, um, we have a process where we can, at the conclusion of an APS investigation, make a uh, warm handoff referral to um, the, an agency called the Elder Abuse Institute of Maine, who's hired um, four elder advocates to work with clients in those counties. Uh, on a more long-term basis um, 
uh, for a variety of different needs that they may have. Uh, so part of that is to, to see whether having that warm handoff advocate process um, results in different outcomes for our clients who are, are in the different counties. Um, so in, in terms of some of the, the main challenges we had, the, the team that we had together before um, was had, had thought of this idea and really we thought we had sorted out a lot of it when we put together the proposal and submitted the grant application. So we, were, we felt like we were really ready to go when we got um, the notice of award and we dove right in. We were um, getting those contracts encumbered, drafting one pagers, developing the survey. And there felt like there, it felt like there was so much work to tackle right off the bat that we didn't um, necessarily take the time that was needed at that stage to make sure we were all speaking the same language. Uh, I, I don't have a research background, so maybe after a couple of months, I finally said, I don't know what, that, what it means, why we can't do X, Y, Z for our survey process, or what is the value of the, of, um, certain parts of the survey uh, and how do I how do I relay that to my staff if I don't understand it so we finally uh, set aside uh, like a half day meeting for the the research consultants to walk APS through what the what the research outcomes and goals were for the project and then I could um, gave a gave a bit of a presentation about what we had in mind um, from a program perspective. Um, so that was uh, one, one of the ways that we strategized to overcome some of the challenges. But overall, one really concrete thing that I would say in terms of strategies would be have someone take minutes, set, set regular meetings up, uh, which we did. But for, for several weeks, we didn't have official minutes. So we were um, periodically saying, did we decide on that? I think that we are all on the same page on this, but kind of had to go back and, uh, and, and rehash some things. So having uh, eventually making this decision to make sure we had formal minutes gave us that structure to look back and say, oh yeah, we don't need to talk through this again. We already made that decision. Um, and really taking the time to explicitly identify the goals, both for the team as a group, and what each piece of the, what each group was looking to do individually. What is a, what is the APS program goals? What are the research program goals? Things like that. What does, what does success mean for this project um, for our clients? Um, and then really coming back to that discussion over time with um, the changes that happened with COVID, it was a really good um, opportunity for us to make sure we could still meet those goals and think about those things um, without, um, uh, with, with all the changes that were going on um, with, our, with our agency and with the state. Um, and overall, I think that the, the major strategy for collaboration for us has been building trust over time. Um, some, we've had to have some challenging conversations where I've, said, you know, our staff can't handle doing um, additional pieces of work right now due to caseloads. And if we don't have that trust and the ability to do, to have open communication about issues and challenges with our research partners, um, then, then that would be a real disadvantage and, and wouldn't enhance the project at all. Um, so um, I sped through that kind of fast, but uh, that's, that's what I've got. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much. I have I, I have questions for both <laughs> you and Kathy already. So um, yeah, thank you. So let's turn to um, Mariah Freark and from Massachusetts. Mariah, hi. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Sure can. Great. I'm not going to get over the meeting model of shouting at my laptop instead of shouting at actual people in person, but. Um, so for our project, like, like my colleagues on this call, um, ACL funding helped with our collaboration by enabling us to do it. 
Um, our grant has two parts. We are rebuilding our database to increase our ability to comply with namers. Um, but the second part is what I'm focusing on today, which is developing an app to help people with disabilities learn to recognize, report, and respond to abuse. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, but um, a professor of computer science heard NPR's Abused and Betrayed series. I think that was 2017 at this point. Um, it was a series uh, in a kind of investigative journalism on NPR about sexual abuse of people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. And this professor ultimately ended up reaching out to DPPC's executive director, Nancy Alterio, to see how he could help. Um, so Nancy had this idea in her head before the funding became available. That's something she's really good at looking at the overall system and where the gaps are so that, you know, when, when a funding opportunity comes along, she already kind of has something in mind and usually has a like a skeleton team teed up and ready to go. So for us, the app development was kind of a stretch idea. It aligned with our agency mission, but it does go beyond our day to day. So the ACL funding helped us work with the partners that had already approached us expressing an interest in this project. So to enhance collaboration when we got our notice of award, um, as one of DPPC's managers says, we got our roller skates on. Even during the grant writing process, we already had, so we had this, this computer scientist who we knew was interested, and, you know, because of that, we had reached out ahead of time while we were writing the grant to some of the other natural collaborators who, if we did get the funding, would be really key to doing this project. So, obviously, that is... Um, self-advocacy organization, as well as the state's Department of Developmental Services. So we kicked it off, um, you know, not unusually by having a meeting with everybody that included the upper level managers who were involved, um, just to make sure that everybody was on the same page as far as sort of the big picture. And then the monthly meetings and the regular work is done by a core team, and that information is shared sort of out and up as necessary. The majority, actually, I think the entirety of our collaboration is external. Because of the nature of the project, we are relying on expertises that we don't necessarily have in-house. You know, we are working with self-advocates who have lived experience with intellectual or developmental disabilities. We've got our, our technology team of this brilliant computer scientist and his brilliant graduate and undergraduate students. We have a professor of human psychology, also brilliant, um, and her really talented undergraduate team. So um, what Mary was saying earlier about, you know, the collaboration being a ne negotiated shared goal, I think is really true for our project. It, we have been successful because of the passion and the energy and the respect that all of our have. So everybody who's at the table wants to be at the table and and we all understand the importance of the roles of everybody else in the room. Um, it, just the, the expertise that's there, the ideas, the perspective that everybody brings. Um, all of the team members are really good about acknowledging that, considering that, valuing that, um, and that has really helped us move forward with the process. Challenge-wise, I think the, the big one off the top of my head, obviously, was COVID-19. Um, you know, one example of this is that we had initially planned to conduct in-person pilot tests. Um, you know, working with folks who have intellectual or developmental disabilities, obviously, in-person is easiest for, you know, people who have processing issues or, I mean, just, I mean, think of the attention span that you have on a, on a Zoom meeting. So we had to figure out how to adapt our pilot testing to a virtual environment. Um, and then strategies for overcoming, you know, sort of all the pandemic related challenges. Um, I had gotten really good advice from Nancy um, in a conversation we had about project management a little while ago, which was basically plan for bumps. And I don't know um, how many of you guys remember Don Rumsfeld during the Iraq war talking about the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, you know, like the things that you can probably guess are going to go awry. And then the things that just come out of like the clear blue sky to, to really throw a wrench into your works. So COVID-19 was a definite unknown unknown. I am very organized as a lawyer. My job is a lot of worst case scenario planning, but even I did not have a plan in place for what do we do if a global pandemic happens? So, that being said, I knew that there would be some kind of unforeseen hitch. 
And so the point is when, when you come across those hitches, you don't want to be so committed to your work plan and, and the how of what you're doing that you can't see that like, hey, this, 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 it's time to pause, it's time to reassess, it's time to regroup. Um, so, I mean, in a way, the sort of nice thing about the pandemic was it was not subtle about the fact that, you know, ev everybody needs to pause and reassess how we're doing like everything in our life. So within our group, we did that by sort of coming back to what is our end goal? Like what, what do we want to do with this, with these funds, with this project, with this sort of brain trust that we've collected? And that is to develop the best app that we can possibly develop under the circumstances, whatever those circumstances end up being. So with that focus, we were able to work with our partners, you know, really integrate it, not integrate, they're, they're already very well integrated, but really lean on the self advocates to help create the best virtual pilot process that the computer scientists could dream up and and that enabled us to move forward and get the information that we could to to continue developing our app so um kind of like aaron it might be a new england thing i feel like i also spent that but i'm um that's what i've got that's great thank you very very much um before um what i'd like to do now is to just open it up for questions from anyone else on the line for uh, the whole panel of Kathy, Aaron, or, and Mariah, or for an individual. And you can do that um, by typing in the chat to everyone so that um, both Maria and I can read it. And I think, um, Andy, if I'm not mistaken, can people also speak? They can indeed. If you want to um, ask a question over audio, all you have to do is unmute your line. Uh, most of you have joined via computer, so you'll just click the little red microphone icon if you have a question. So we'll give it a second to see if there are any questions. It looks like I got one organizer question um, specifically to us that asked if, um, does the tribe have an APS program? And if so, how does Oklahoma APS program work with them? So I think this was for Kathy again. Does the tribe itself have an APS program? And if so, how does Oklahoma APS program work with them? We actually have several different tribes across the state that do have their own APS programs. Some don't have an APS program per se, but they have more of specialists who work with aging, so they may not do exactly what we do, but they still may go out and provide services to either their elders. Some do work with vulnerable adults as well that are 18 and over. So it's very much dependent on the tribe and how they have their own programs set up. We do work very closely with those tribes. And there are some who may not do involuntary services where the Oklahoma APS program does. So if their situation needs an emergency guardianship, then state APS may step in to assist with that. The Oklahoma City Indian Clinic, because they serve, it's not really a, a tribe per se, it's more of a, a health clinic that provides a multitude of services they don't have an APS program. They do have social workers who work there and can offer services, but they do something very different from what APS does. Thank you. Um, there's another question for Kathy, but before we go to, to that, it's specific to Oklahoma. Is there, are there any questions that people have for um, Mariah or Erin? So I'll jump in with a question that um, Aaron, well, when you were talking, but this is actually a question for all three of you. <clears throat> I'm interested in, in this, uh, the concept of building trust, which I do think is key to collaboration. Um, you know, I'm curious about how does that get broken down into real life? Um, so for example, we're in the, we're, we need to hand, we need to hire somebody to come and do some chores around our house, like a handy person. 
and, and my partner and I were talking about, well, how do we know this person's good? And I was like, so they, they are responsive to the email. They show up on time. They do their job. You know, the bill is what they said that it was going to be or, you know, plus or minus 5%. So I had in my head a picture of what a trustworthy handy person would look like. What did trust end up, what were the elements that you think created trust? So I'll go to you, Aaron, because you mentioned it and how important it was, but I wonder if everybody could also, like uh, if all three of you could just touch on it. Like what were the practical things that you did that made trust possible? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and it's a tough question, I'd say too. Um, and in some ways it's, it's just what you said. People showed up when they said they would, they um, met the deliverables that they mentioned that they were going to do before we met again. Um, but, but beyond that, I think some of it, it was built over time. Um, and especially recognizing the, as we talked about our goals for the project um, being, you know, being respectful of what other people felt was um, was going to make the project successful, um, and and all being invested in that same way. But that it really did, you know. Now that we're in the third year, I feel like it's a a really strong um, relationship. Um, but maybe that was that just took a little while to to get there. Not because of um, you know, suspicion among the group or anything, but just because everyone's so busy. And um, I know during our first year, we had the opportunity to have our consultants, um, you know, our Elder Abuse Institute's based in Maine, but we had three consultants from across the country come and we had an all day meeting two days in a row to really hammer out some details in year one. And you know we we were able to go out to dinner back back in the day indoors um, and mm -hmm. and and get to know each other and and what made us tick as a group and why we were all so passionate about not just the project but the work that um, that is involved in combating elder abuse um, overall. So uh, nice. I don't think there's a magic key to it for sure, but those those were the things that worked for us. Okay, Mariah, did you have any did did anything strike you as I was asking um, Aaron the question? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with Aaron on, you know, one of the cornerstones of trust is basically just doing what you say, what you say you're going to do, even if it's something as simple as like, oh yeah, I'll follow up and, and get you that email address that we talked about. Um, I, and, and it does, it does take time. I think kind of, again, what Aaron said, it's, it's not necessarily due to suspicion. It's just, you know, especially if you're working for a new partner, you have a blank slate and, and you want to be conscious of sort of what you're drawing on that slate and make sure that it's positively moving toward trust. But the other one that I was sort of thinking about um, is sort of basic, you know, human and interaction 101 as far as um, being respectful when you are engaging with other people and making sure that you are acknowledging the expertise, especially when that's expertise that you don't have, and being able to kind of sit on your ego and say, you know what, I, I don't have all the answers. I'm not the best at this. I'm not the smartest person at this table. Um, and and not just, I mean, I, I think you you need to sort of fundamentally understand that but i think if you have that attitude outwardly and say i you know i don't know anything about this that's that's why you're here that's why you're at my table that's why you're on my project because you know i value that that helps build trust and it helps get people i mean you're getting buy in as well because they're thinking you know oh i'm i'm here for a purpose i'm not just like sitting in a chair you know checking off a box they need my input they need my energy i can i can give something to this project so those are those are my thoughts about trust from from a lawyer so yeah. that is a grain of salt right well i mean, i there's a part of me this is mary that thinks that minutes help build trust because you aren't going back to that well i said that last week or i said it last meeting like it's there then you have it and i thought that was interesting Aaron, that you were like oh we didn't do minutes i hate minutes personally i hate minutes but um, they do serve a purpose. And I was wondering if maybe they also served a purpose in terms of trust building because they are a record that then everyone feels comfortable and can rely on. Um, 
So Kathy, we had another question for you, but feel free to also chime in on trust. But there was a question um, you can probably see in the chat. Will Oklahoma be able to maintain the self-neglect specialist at the clinic? We don't know the answer to that yet. We are hoping that we will be able to. I think a lot of it is going to depend on the state budget and what that looks like at the end of the grant period, as well as are there additional grants that we're able to apply for and if we're awarded those grants. I will say that we would love to be able to do that, but it will probably depend on how successful that the outcome is for the grant. Okay. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight as far as the trust piece for us was recognizing that our tribal nations are sovereign nations. And I am so glad that Mariah had mentioned respect because for us coming in, having to be respectful of that and recognize that our different tribal entities have their own regulations, they have their own programs, and it really being able to work with them and being respectful of that is what helped us in building mm -hmm. trust. Thank you. There was a, a something you said, Mariah, that made me also um, noted down, which was how you had um, a variety of levels of leadership. And I wanted to ask all three of you what role leadership plays in success around collaboration. Um, sounded like there was a, a working group that sort of takes the ball and runs with it, but I just wondered if for all of you, did leadership play a role either? Um, sometimes um, that can be very positive and sometimes it can be um, uh, possibly a challenge. So Mariah, I'll start with you since you were the one that mentioned it. Sure. Um, so we have been very blessed in that the leadership that is involved um, is positively involved. They, uh, everybody has a vested interest, um, both at, within DPPC and um, with our external partners. So, yeah, I, I think that it's, it's a balance of, um, I guess one thing that, that our executive director is really good at is, is delegating and kind of giving people enough. She definitely wants to stay in the loop, but she doesn't need to be on, you know, every single email about everything that's happening. I can just sort of give her the digest snippets of, you know, sort of the, the high points. And if she has specific questions, she'll follow up. And I know that that works, you know, kind of the same way with our with the other managers at DPPC who end up touching this project. Um, our IT director is not the, just where we are in the app development. Um, he's not currently involved. He was in at the beginning and when we get to the point where the app is um, communicating with the DPPC hotline, um, he will end up getting looped back in and and I think you know in the meantime he knows that I will flag stuff for him if it's necessary. So I think that that's um, for me, what's been most helpful is the leadership um, has has kind of given us the room to do what we need to do um, while, you know, remaining sort of in the loop and available if, if we have questions or need follow up. Thank you. Erin or Kathy, any thoughts on the role of leadership in um, either um, thwarting collaboration or encouraging collaboration, supporting it? I would just say um, one thing that's been really important for us to keep in mind is kind of leadership at all levels, um, where some of the, a lot of the ideas around this project were from central office and uh, where a statewide program uh, made up of, uh, of uh, staff who are mostly in district offices. So if with, with things like, for instance, our client surveys, which everyone uh, in the APS program at first thought, wow, this is going to be really challenging. On top of all of our work already, we're going to be asking clients to fill out a survey and they're going to hate that and what's that going to do to building rapport? So identifying a few caseworkers who are having success with um, delivering those to clients and then having them um, give that feedback to their to their coworkers, say, here's what I'm doing, why don't you try this? Um, just you know, kind of true for all aspects of, of the work, I'd say not just um, unique to this project, um, but 
but highlighting um, anyone who's who is in, excited about the project and, and wants to take on a leadership role has been really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mary, this is Maria. I just wanted yeah. to add with Erin that that was really smart to bring on the early adopters, you know, the enthusiastic people and bring them on. Uh, a question that I thought of when you were talking, when all three of you were talking about leadership was, have you lost a significant leader or partner in your work? And what was the result of that loss and how did you handle the situation? Well, I can tell you in Oklahoma, we did have a change in leadership. I think it was probably in October of last year, the APS director retired and she was very instrumental in assisting with the writing of the grant, very involved in managing the grant process. So when she left, we weren't sure exactly what was going to happen or how that would affect the grant. But I will say that the new leadership that came on board their role has been different because they weren't there from the inception of the grant, but they have been every bit as supportive and encouraging and allowing us to do the things that we need to do to make sure this is successful. So I've seen both sides of the leadership, one who was there really, this was almost part of her baby as well, but then seeing the support and the encouragement continue with the change in leadership that we really want to see this be successful. The way that we handled it was just open discussions with our partners so that they were aware as soon as we found out that Gail was leaving, that they knew when Jeremy was hired, making those introductions, making those connections so that people would know one another and helping to make sure that that trust remained within the team. And Maria, I'm knocking on wood because I haven't lost. We haven't lost anyone <laughs> super close to the project, but we did start um, our grant um, year one. We had a change in administration, so a big piece of that first year was making sure that the new administration coming in, the new leadership at our commissioner's office and and the director of my office um, understood what we were trying to accomplish and um, and uh, and go from there. Thank you. So Andy, I check in with you just to make sure that we haven't missed anything in the chat. Sure, yeah, it looks like there was one question that was posted to organizers um, and I'll read it twice, just a tiny bit longer than a sentence. On a micro, on a more micro level, our APS program is reluctant to collaborate with, um, with other providers on APS cases due to the sensitive, sensitive nature of the case. It seems like the better investigation service delivering client care could occur if we more openly collaborated. How do other APS providers collaborate on the micro level? Let me read that one more time. On the micro level, our APS program is reluctant to collaborate with other providers because of the sensitive nature of the case. Um, it, but it seems like there would be better investigation service delivery and client care um, if there was more open collaboration. Um, how do other APS providers collaborate on the micro level? Great question. Um, I'm going to obviously let the three, the, the two things that occur to me, this is Mary, I want the three, got, three of you presenters to answer, but I'm wondering if it, if it's about confidentiality or if it's about something that I've experienced where APS programs were worried about liability issues that if they shared what they were doing with another entity that then the program might leave itself open, leaving the leaving the program open to scrutiny and judgment. So it seems like it could be confidentiality or it could be that other issue. But let's, yeah, um, Kathy, Aaron, or Mariah, or anyone else on the line, we would love to hear from all of you who are listening in. Um, you may I also have had experience with that. For us, when we, um, when we, encumbered our contract with the Elder Abuse Institute and they hired advocates, we set up kickoff meetings with the county um, caseworkers who would be making referrals to those people so they could put faces with names and know the background of the people that would actually be working with their clients. Um, 
And then to protect confidentiality, we, we set up a process where a client has to course consent before we're sharing that information. Um, so we can also do a warm, a, a, a kind of a joint meeting if a client would even prefer that um, rather than just a different person showing up at their door, giving them a phone call. Um, so I think that those would be the, the main things I would, I would mention for that. Something that we do just uh, not uh, my my projects don't necessarily relate to confidentiality and sort of individual client services, but overall, just to assist us when in with investigations is we have a bunch of memorandums of understanding um, with our state service providing agencies, as well as um, all of the district attorney's offices. So that really helps cover us um, and set up a framework for when you share information, what the flow is, who's responsible, um, you know, and, and all of that. So that might be, that might be something to consider as well. Yeah, in Oklahoma, I think we're similar to Montana. I noticed that Michael had posted in chat that they have in their MCA under confidentiality to share it, information necessary to providers. And it, we're pretty much the same way. We can share some information as needed to make sure a client gets the services that they need. We also do have some of our counties who are members of multidisciplinary teams where they are able to share information and staff cases, try and ensure that our clients get what they need. And those, it's a really great question. And I think one that we, we could take a whole other time to talk about how to manage that concern on the part of leadership, how to manage it on a very practical level, how to manage it on a sort of on a more emotional level, and um, what, what practical value comes um, to, to the program and to the APS client as a result of that collaboration. Um, as you all may know, we updated the APS guidelines recently, and um, there are some, some of the research of the last couple of years there have been a couple models where like APS partnered with legal services, APS partnering with mental health in a really collaborative way, like where they might be even co-located in, in a couple instances and how much benefit accrued to the client as a result of those collaborations. So people are doing it. There are ways to do it. And I really appreciate the question very much. So I think we are, uh, just rounding the bend to the hour, I just want to open it up and see if there are any other questions in chat or anyone else on the line, or or is there anything that um, Mariah, Kathy, or Aaron would like to to say in closing about their projects? No pressure. I don't know about the other two, but it has been a cra crazy time, and I don't think any of us would ever have dreamed of some of the challenges we would encounter through COVID. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. That that these projects have um, transformed, that new ideas have come. You know, maybe the best argument for the benefits of collaboration yet, um, because if you can still execute a project that was not designed with a global pandemic in mind, but, but you've managed to keep going and do it, you know, you're, the strength of the collaboration is one of the things that sees you through a difficult time like this. Mariah, I was actually very happy that you had not considered a global pandemic in your planning, because I think that you might want to consult a mental health professional had that been like in the vast number of things that could have occurred. Like, yes, yeah, check, global pandemic, we have a plan for that. Um, no, that's good that you had not, you didn't have a plan, but we'll probably all have plans in the future. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to, um, to Maria. Uh, thank you to Erin and Kathy and Mariah for your um, wisdom and for sharing examples that, you, you know, you make yourself a little vulnerable coming on a call like this and sharing your experience. <laughs> and thanks to all of you who, who asked questions. And, um, and I think we can say that that's a can wrap. You, and Can you go to the next oh, slide, please? please. Yes. The next slide. Oh, my yeah. God. Hold on. It's not moving. There we go. One more time. Okay. Thank and you. go ahead, Leslie, I'll let you explain the slide. Well, follow as, us. 
Mary was saying, thank you very much for attending today. I just want to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and all registrants will be notified when the recording becomes available. Our next session is scheduled for this coming Thursday, November 5th at 3 o'clock p.m. If you have any questions in the interim, feel free to reach out to us at the APS TARC TA email address on the slide or check out some of our other technical assistance resources on the APS TARC website. We will talk to you all soon. Thank you again, Mariah, Aaron, and Kathy. And please, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank bye you. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Bye. 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 -bye.